Hello, this is Ross Bliley from the podcast Pigskin Tales. This podcast is sponsored by Sterling Soap Company. With products sold throughout 41 locations around the globe, Sterling Soap Company has a unique assortment of products to choose from for your loved one for the holidays. Handmade artisan soaps created by Roderick and Amanda Lovin since 2012, these products are affordable and provide great value. Act now and save on your shipping costs. If you purchase $75 or more, your shipping cost is free in the United States. Shop now online at sterlingsoap.com. What's up, sports history fan? Dana Augusta here of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. Ever wish you can get behind the scenes access to the Hockey Hall of Fame and dive into the untold stories that shaped the game? Then you need to check out Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories Part 2 by Eric Zwieg. Eric's latest book is packed with wild, unexpected tales from epic rivalries and game-changing moments to quirky incidents like polo injuries and snowblower mishaps. Eric Zwieg's impeccable research and passion for the sport of hockey will whisk you through the NHL's early years, the origins of the Three Stars tradition, and how hockey first hit the airways, plus you get fresh takes on legends like Wayne Gretzky, Bobby Hall, and Joe Sackick. Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2 is available now wherever you get your books. Grab your copy and get ready to dive deep into the heart of the game. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old school basketball to a new school audience. And today we bring you the story of the trial of Spencer Haywood. He had one of the most convoluted entries to the NBA. It was two leagues and two teams embroiled in a lawsuit to see where Haywood belonged. That was not an easy thing to figure out because there were so many rules involved in how someone enters the NBA. So what was the big deal with Haywood's entry into the NBA? Well, primarily, he signed a contract with the Seattle Supersonics in 1970 without going through the NBA draft. And that would simply not work. Every team had to have a chance to select Haywood in a proper draft. That is what the lawsuit was about. So let us go back to the beginning of the story to see how we got to the point where a lawsuit became necessary. Haywood went to Pershing High School in Detroit, Michigan, and he led his team to a state championship in 1967. He was clearly a gifted player. The guy was six foot eight or 203 centimeters, and he was silky smooth. He was one of the greatest scorers of his generation. However, he was not the greatest student in the world, and that in itself is not that unusual. For every great student athlete like Bill Bradley or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, there are players like Spencer Haywood or Moses Malone who are simply not interested in school and relied on basketball for their success. Now, Haywood did not have the marks or test scores to qualify for a scholarship at a Division I university, despite his immense basketball talent. Therefore, he ended up at Trinidad State Junior College in Colorado. Now, just to clarify, attending a junior college or a community college does not have the same requirements for entry as a top-level university. Now, this is why many great athletes with academic struggles play at schools like this. So, what does Haywood do in his one year in junior college? Well, he scored 28 points per game and snatched 22 rebounds per game. Haywood was clearly too good for this level of basketball, but his academics prevented him from going directly to a top university. In fact, he played so well for Trinidad State that he was invited to be part of the 1968 U.S. Olympic team. He was the youngest player on that team and the only one who did not come from a top university, the military, or an adult amateur league. In other words, he was coming from the lowest level of college basketball, but his talent earned him the spot. Now, once home from the Olympics with a gold medal around his neck, he transferred to the University of Detroit. His academic marks were not necessarily any better than they were the year before, but moving to a university from a junior college is far easier than trying to get there directly from high school. Of course, this is not an episode on the rules of academic eligibility to play American university level athletics, but suffice to say, 
he was welcomed with open arms at the University of Detroit, the same city where his family lived and where he went to high school. At Detroit, he scored 32 points per game and pulled down nearly 22 rebounds per game. And this guy had NBA written all over him since he was in high school. These numbers were absolutely incredible. Anyone with these kinds of numbers was bound to be a top pick in the NBA draft. However, the NBA used to have a rule that prevented players from leaving school early. The rule was one that the NBA created themselves that said that no player could be drafted until he was four years out of high school. In reality, the rule was written in a more technical manner than that, but that is essentially the outcome of the rule. So, if Haywood finished high school in 1967, it meant that he would not be eligible to be drafted into the NBA until the summer of 1971. And that is a very important part of this story. But Haywood was clearly ready for the professional ranks from a basketball perspective. To continue playing at the University of Detroit would be a complete waste of his time. Now, unlike the NBA, the ABA had no such rules about who they could sign. They were very willing to take players early from school and sign them to lucrative contracts. And that is exactly what they did. The Denver Rockets, who are today known as the Denver Nuggets, went ahead and signed a 20-year-old Spencer Haywood two full years before he would have been able to play in the NBA. The ABA did this kind of thing all the time. They offered these young players lots of money to play in the ABA and they had no competition because the NBA would not take them till later. This is how they signed Moses Malone, George Gervin, Julia Serving, and others. And just to show how great Haywood was, as a 20-year-old rookie playing against grown men, he led the entire ABA in scoring and rebounding. He scored 30 points per game and grabbed nearly 20 rebounds per game. He won the ABA Rookie of the Year award. He was also the ABA All-Star Game MVP and the ABA League MVP. He led his team all the way to the ABA Finals, where they lost to the Los Angeles Stars. I mean, the guy won every individual award there was and proved to be the best player in the league in a very short time. So after his one year in the ABA, he felt that it was time to move up to the NBA to show them how good he really was. So he worked with Sam Schulman, the owner of the brand new Seattle Supersonics and signed an NBA contract. But there was one problem. The Sonics took Haywood without going through the draft. A legal battle was about to start to figure out where Haywood belonged. So this is a good place to take a break and I'll be right back with how everything turned out. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of you unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876 including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, ROW number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hello, sports history fans. I'm Ross from the podcast Pigskin Tales. You're about to jump into another thrilling sports history moment. But first, let's dive into today's sponsor, just in time for the holiday season. Introducing Art of Words, the brainchild of word artist Dan Duffy from Philadelphia. Dan meticulously crafts stunning images by handwriting relevant words from some of the greatest sports moments in time. These unique budget-friendly illustrations are the perfect gift, sparking cherished memories and capturing hearts. Choose from city skylines, sports, history, and musicians to find a piece for everyone. And here's the exciting part. For that sports fanatic in your life, 
gift them a piece of their favorite team or player's history. Art of Words tells a compelling story. Explore collegiate stadiums, each meticulously crafted with every football victory etched into words. Or venture into baseball stadiums, handwritten with every player from the team's illustrious history. My favorite on the site is Bryce Harper 2021 MVP year. Because I'm a big stats guy, I think that's one of the coolest things ever. Check it out. Don't wait. Order a print today for yourself and your loved one this holiday season. Transform your wall into a gallery of captivating art and surprise your family and friends with a print of their own. Use code SHN15 at artofwords.com for a 15% discount on your order in November and December. Visit Art of Words, where words magically transform into stunning art, evoking cherished memories and touching the hearts of those who you care about. Again, use the code SHN15 for 15% off at artofwords.com. Welcome back to the show, and let us continue with our story on the trial of Spencer Haywood. Just before the break, Haywood played his rookie year with the Denver Rockets of the ABA as a 20-year-old rookie and won every significant individual player award. Then, he tried to just jump over to the Supersonics even though he had not gone through the NBA draft. And as you may know, every player that wants to enter the NBA has to go through the draft. The order of selection is determined by record from the previous year. Essentially, the worst teams get to pick first, and then the really good teams get to pick last. Now, I admit that is an oversimplification of how the draft works, but that is the general principle that the draft is based on. With the Sonics simply signing Haywood away from the ABA, the team circumvented the draft, and the other teams in the NBA would not let that stand. If any team could just sign anyone they wanted, then theoretically, the New York Knicks could just sign the top player available every single year and quickly build themselves into some sort of a super team. That is not how the NBA works. The Supersonics sued the NBA to be able to keep Haywood despite not going through the draft like they were supposed to. And the case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And the justices voted 7-2 to two in Haywood's favor. He could stay with the Supersonics. As part of the decision, the Supreme Court deemed that the draft is illegal if it blocked players from entering the NBA who were otherwise talented enough and qualified to play. So the NBA, by Supreme Court ruling, had to create a way for players to enter the NBA without finishing their four years at a university. The new rule was nicknamed the hardship rule. It required that any player that wanted to leave school early for the NBA had to prove financial hardship. In the case of Haywood, he was one of 10 children raised in poverty. He easily qualified for hardship. And Seattle got to keep Haywood without having to go to the draft. Of course, the NBA had to make sure that nothing like that ever happened again. A team cannot just sign someone without going to the draft. The impact of this legal decision had a huge impact on college basketball. Players knew that they could now leave early if they could prove financial hardship. And honestly, it was not that hard to prove. Even middle class and upper class players could prove hardship if they could demonstrate that their parents were no longer supporting them financially. And that's not very hard to do on paper. That has trickled down to today where the very top players often leave school early after just a single year to join the NBA. From the late 90s to the early 2000s, the NBA was taking high school players like Kevin Garnett, Kobe Bryant, and LeBron James. Today, players have to be out of high school for one year before they can go to the NBA. That could be playing at a university or just playing anywhere like an overseas league or in the NBA's G League. But what Haywood did was pave a path for extremely talented youngsters like himself to be able to enter the NBA early and start making money right away. And we should not underestimate what he did for all of the players that came after him. While the early path to the NBA may have changed and been modified over the years, the fact is, Spencer Haywood is the one who created that early path in the first place. As for Haywood himself, he made the NBA All-Star Game in four of his first five seasons in the league. And then he developed a drug addiction. He did not go to another All-Star Game after that. He was traded to the Knicks, and then after a couple of years, he went to the Jazz and then the Lakers, where he was cut from the Lakers in the middle of the NBA Finals because of his addiction. 
He then went on to play in Italy for a year and then returned to the Washington Bullets. He finished his career in 1983, scoring just eight points per game in his final season. But when he was young and healthy, he was an unstoppable scorer. He was inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame in 2015, and he is still with us today. He is married and living in Nevada. So the next time that you see a university player leaving school early for the NBA, just remember that it would not have been possible without the efforts of Spencer Haywood. Well, that is it for today. Join us next time when we share the story of Magic Johnson's greatest game. Spoiler alert, it happened during his rookie year. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mind the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the football history dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.